How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez and Dave Meltzer here. Wrestling Observer Radio is February 21, 2024. Figure 4 online.com slash wrestlingobserver.com. we got a lot of news to get into here today. And uh, Dave, what's going on? I don't know. How's Hawaii? Well, Hawaii was terrible today, but in general, it's awesome. Uh-huh. Well, I was d- so d- 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 sick today. Yeah, I heard. I was so sick. But now I feel all right. So Was it like food poisoning? I had uh, some stomach flu, which uh, Paisley got a week ago, and then Hanalei got, and then Whitney got, and I thought, I'm the only one that's not going to get it. And then it uh, turns out I was not the only one that didn't get it. So, But I'm alive. I'm ready to go. So uh, okay. let's talk some news, because there's a lot of it to get into there's here a today. a lot of news. Vince McMahon and uh, John Cena on Howard Stern and Randy Orton. For Sports Illustrated, a bunch of guys had things to say about Vince McMahon. And uh, I guess we can start with John Cena. A lot of people uh, have a lot to say about this one. He said, and I quote, I can say this, I'm a big advocate of love and friendship and honesty and communication. But in the same breath, I'm also a big advocate of accountability. I think you explain it well. If someone's behavior lies so far outside your value system, that the balance shifts of like, I can't operate in a world where this works. That's the end result of being accountable. He said, right now what I'm going to do is love the person I love, be their friend. And by that, it means like, hey, I love you. You have a hill to climb. There's a saying of you don't know who your friends are until the shit hits the fan or your back's against the wall. That doesn't make any of what's going on any easier to swallow. But just telling somebody like, hey, I love you, man. This is going to be a hill to climb. We're going to see what happens. And that's that. Yeah, I I actually listened to the whole thing in context, and um, the best person on that was Howard Stern. He went into a big speech about how, you know, people he's known have, you know, things have come out about them, and you know, basically said that you know it's it's it it it's it's a mind fuck is what he said because like what do you do when your friend they've been your friends and then all of a sudden you find out this stuff about them, and he said that in some cases. When you find out the stuff is really bad, you just can't have anything to do with them. You know, he says there's a line. And, you know, in some cases, you can still be their friends, but in some cases, you just can't. And then he asked John Cena about it, and uh, that was what John Cena said. And um, no compassion towards the victim at all. And um, I thought it came off, um, you know, I mean, it's it's a weird thing because, you know, I can remember when the Cosby stuff first broke and all the people who were like in his TV cast and the people who, you know, had known him and were friends with him were so defensive of him. And, you know, there's no defense, you know, I mean, like, especially in his case, because there were so many. And in this case, it's, you know, it's the same thing. You know, I mean, I'm not saying it's the it's as bad necessarily or not as bad, but it's the same thing. It's it's really um it's really bad stuff and you know john cena just um you know he's the team player and he's going to say that i was not surprised in the least that he said it but um i thought it came off very badly and um orton you know i mean it was funny because people are going like oh you know randy orton came off good and it's like he really didn't but compared to john cena he did so because of that such a low bar that John Cena set. Um, Randy didn't come off nearly as bad. I mean, the Sports Illustrated quotes for Randy weren't too bad, but the New York Post quotes, you know, and, and Randy was doing uh, press because uh, the A and E thing, um, you know, it debuts this coming week, this coming Sunday. There's an A and E biography on Randy Orton, which is which I understand is actually very interesting. You know, it talks about a lot of the stuff, you know, when he was younger and and you know the suicide he attempted and um just a lot of the problems that he had in wwe you know and so i mean they they do address a lot of that stuff in there but you know he also um you know when it you know i mean his his thing was is uh i've actually got the quotes right here so he had two for the new york post yeah he said i've seen the horrible things online but i don't want to believe because this man has done so many things for me if it wasn't for him i wouldn't have been given second and third chances in wwe 
and probably fourth and fifth. I wouldn't be in the position I'm in now if it wasn't for that man, so part of me wants to not believe it. And then the other part of me understands that he could have done all these wonderful things for me in the business and created this amazing thing that will go on and on well after he's gone. But on the other hand, he's human, and he made some fucking terrible mistakes. He says there's three sides to every story, their side, the other side, and the truth. I think a lot more has to come out before I can really speak on any of this. I think that would be the case for any talent that you ask. But I do know about Vince McMahon, the man that I've known for the past 24 years personally. I owe him for everything he has done for me. I say that with conviction because I wouldn't be in this position without a lot of help from him. But if these allegations are true, it's some horrible shit right there. I'm torn. It's hard. And then for Sports Illustrated, he said, I've got to say this. I wouldn't be where I am without Vince McMahon taking a chance on me a handful of times. I wouldn't be where I am today without Vince, but fuck, I'm reading this shit. What you've seen and read, I've seen and read as far as commenting on that. It fucking hurts my heart. It hurts my head. So that was Randy Orton's comments about Vince. Yeah, yeah. again, no sympathies for the victim. Um, and in, in the case of, you know, and when I say victim, I actually should use plural because obviously there's far more than one victim here. There's the victim that everyone's read about, but there's other victims too, many others. And um, so I, I, again, I will say this when he said, like, you know, if you talk to the talent, they'll, they'll all say about the same thing. It's like I've been in contact with a lot of the talent and they're not defensive events like this. Um, of course, they're not saying anything publicly and they're not saying anything for attribution. And maybe if they did, they they would. Um, but I just know that, um, you know, it's it's you can read it. And, you know, yeah, of course, there's two sides to every story, but. There's stuff that's right there, you know. It's, it's right there in black and white. I mean, and you, it's it's stuff that you you just can't overlook. And um, you know, they're both put in a bad place. They're not going to say they, they're they're going to be defensive of of you know of him. I mean, one of the things that I thought was interesting with Orton, and it, it goes with like a lot of the wrestlers, and it's true. Everything that he said, you know, is in the sense that he gave me second and third and fourth chances and all that. You know why he did. And this is a lot of the things that, like, the big difference between um, wrestlers and, you know, athletes is that wrestlers think that they are nicely given chances. And to a degree, it's true. The reason Randy Orton got second, third, and fourth chances wasn't because Vince McMahon, you know, liked him. It was because he thought he could make money with him. And because Randy Orton had talent and, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like, it's like a football coach. And if there's a player who is a marginal player and he screws up, he'll be cut. If there's a player who's like a freaking superstar player, they're going to get chance after chance after chance. And I mean, you know, you can name football players that were great football players that did some pretty horrible things that got chance after chance. And it wasn't due to the generosity or niceness of the owner or, or being forgiven. It's because the guy was a freaking great football player. And, and you know, and people will bend over backwards because of your talent. And, I mean, that's the thing with Randy Orton is it's like, yeah, he got chances because they bent over backwards because of his talent and his look. And it's 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 not like, oh, you know, he's been so magnanimous to me because the reality is is that, like, when Randy Orton – Let's just say, um, especially if, it, you know, when when Randy Orton, you know, was given chance after chance and when he was failed the drug tests and they changed the rules, the Randy Orton rule, you know, where now all of a sudden three is three strikes isn't out anymore like it used to be. Um, you know, the reason that they did that was because they didn't want Randy Orton going to TNA, just as an example, which was their whatever, you know, their adversary wasn't a strong adversary but it was an adversary at the time you know it's like that's why they did it they didn't do it out of you know niceness to randy orton they did it out of um the fact that randy orton was a really talented guy and you know a, a lot of these guys it's like oh vince gave me a chance and it's like yeah he did because you could draw money you know it's 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 like again like a star athlete and or a star um entertainer you know if you're if you're a promoter and uh, a guy can draw money in concerts all over he's going to get away with a hell of a lot and they're going to bury things and they're going to bend over backwards for him because he's got talent 
you know, and, and like with Orton, you know, if it wasn't for this and this, you know, if it wasn't for, you know, ever some, Jeff Hardy's a perfect example of this. If, if something like this happens, you know, and you don't get a chance and you go too far, what's going to happen? The other company is going to sign you in a heartbeat because that's how wrestling works. What's with the CM Punk, Jeff Hardy, anytime Bruiser Brody, anytime this stuff happens, that's what the wrestling business is. And in enough time, if he had gone to TNA, and gone there for, you know, a couple of years or he had screwed up in TNA or something like that, Vince would take him back. I mean, Jeff Hardy's again, is the perfect example of all of this. You know, it's these, these, you know, it's the fact that you're talented and, 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 and not even talented. Well, I mean, there is talent to it, but the fact there's a lot of guys that are talented that aren't draws. But, um, if you're talented enough that people will react to you at that level. So, um, but, you know that's different. That's a different situation. But uh, yeah, that's as far as the quotes go. Sure, you know. Um, but again, you know, it's just like, oh, I'm so sorry about Vince. It's like it's not the guy you should be sorry about, or the guy they're given. You know, well, I just, I, I mean, I can see. I don't want to believe it. You know, if, if if I had a friend like that, I wouldn't want to believe it. And people, like I said, the Cosby example is a perfect example. It's like all those people back Cosby until you just couldn't anymore. And uh, what did you make of the Paul Roma interview, talking about things that he had heard in the late 80s, early 90s? Well, I mean, Paul Roma thing was, was uh, the Jim Power story, which everybody had, had heard. I mean, there's nothing really new other than this allegation of something that, that was so much worse than anything um, that Janelle Grant went through. Um, but that one, um, you know, he wouldn't say. I mean, Ashley um, Banfield was just you know, like trying to get it out of him and he wouldn't say, but he just said there's this horrible thing, but he didn't want to say it. Um, so it was just, that's kind of where it was. But the Jim Powers thing, I mean, it's certainly a story that's gone around for years and years. And Jim Powers himself said it, you know, he said it happened at Toronto in a Holiday Inn um, while they were on the road. And one of the executives basically propositioned him and said, you know, you want to make some extra money? And he goes, yeah, of course. And then he explained what he wanted him to do, which is basically sexual favors, and Powers turned him down, and they claimed that the team, you know, stopped getting a push because of that, and, you know, who knows? Who knows? I mean, there were people... I remember the Young Stallions, um, and I remember that... Um, I remember people in power... Um, at the time, there were people in power who thought that they had a great look. You know, they both had fantastic physiques, good-looking guys, Um Paul Roma was a very good wrestler. Uh, Powers was okay. Um, did they, could they have been pushed harder? Yes, they could have. Um, were they pushed way less than their ability dictated? I can't say that. I mean, they were, they were about where, given the talent of, that was around at the time, they were about where they should have been maybe slightly. They, they could have been slightly higher. I mean, it's possible. Um, so it's like, can you say that this is why they didn't get a push? Borderline. But the fact is, is that, um, you know, uh, an executive from the company, I mean, shouldn't be propositioning the guys who think that they need to do it or their push is going to get cut. And maybe their push did get cut. You cannot say, I mean, there's been enough stuff of, of, of things that have happened, you know, as far as like the Tom Cole story where, you know, he didn't give in to Terry Garvin, and then he ended up getting fired. It's like, you know, there's there's enough stuff, there's enough smoke there that you can't say it, it. You know, it didn't hurt their push, but this type of stuff. I mean, the reality is, is like, you know, in the '80s, it was a different world. Okay, I mean, it really was. People could get away with a lot more, um, but it doesn't make it right because in the '80s, people could get away with it. It's really terrible. You know, if you really think back on it, whether you're a guy or, a, you know, a woman and you believe you're getting you're getting hit on by executives, whether they are gay or straight. And you're thinking that, you know, it could affect my career. Um, and, you know, you're put in that position and you should never be put in that position. And and, you know, again, it's not like this stuff was secretive. I mean, you know, just like with the the. The Jim Power story. That story's been around for, for, for decades. And 
you know that there that was that so that was like the main story there from him um the other thing i guess that came out um it kind of um the cara pipia thing you know ashley mazzaro's uh daughter alexis basically said that you know she wasn't her mom's best friend although she was at one point but then you know kind of said well you know everything in the affidavit was true but we wouldn't have gone to the press about it you know um and she did and um you know she basically then later said that maybe i opened up uh you know maybe i shouldn't have said anything um but she doesn't speak for our family and i mean the thing is on that is you know because when she I think there was a lot of people when she started were just like jumping for joy, like, oh, yeah, all that stuff that was said, it was all false. And then she basically said, well, you know, and m most of the stuff was just, you know, you could tell with with Kara Pipia, it, 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 in, in her case, if you just read the affidavit, you know, you're getting 80 percent, 85 percent of what Kara said and the other 15 percent easily if she was. And even the daughter said she was her best friend at one point. Evidently, they had a falling out before she died, but she was her best friend. And, you know, her story is probably, again, it sounded very similar to the affidavit. There were a few minor discrepancies. And like I said, when they came out, it's like you're, you're doing memories of stuff from, you know, years and years later. You know, you're telling a story. You know, from, uh, I mean, the incident at the, at the base took place in 2006. There are places say 2007, but that was a mistake. It was 2006. Um, but she, in her affidavit, when she was reciting it to Kairos, the lawyer, Constantine Kairos, she herself said 2007, um, which is where the confusion came. The actual tour was 2006. But, um, you know, it's at the end of the day, that story is, um, you know, been, you know, whatever it was uh, corroborated as far as her being told by the doctor and the fact that WWE didn't know and had never heard, you know, John Laurinaitis is now, um, you know, basically, um, no, it, well, but it wasn't it, it, John Laurinaitis. The doctor said that he went to John, Dr. Rio said he went to John Laurinaitis and John Laurinaitis knew that tells you at least that, you know, it's, it's, it's a lock that they knew. And then they said that they didn't. And so at that point, when you're lying, you know, I can, the burden of proof seems to go in the um, Ashley Massaro situation with her version. And she did tell the doctor her version. She did tell her ex-best friend her version and um, Paul London. And, you know, it's a, it's a lot out there. AW has hired Jennifer Pepperman, who was working in creative for WWE for the last seven years. And she just ended up leaving, I think, about a week ago. Like, yeah, and, about a week. Yep. She's worked on a number of soap operas, One Life to Live as the World Turns, multiple daytime Emmy Awards, and is close to Mercedes Monet. Well, when, like, when, when she quit last week, I mean, I was actually told by WWE that they expected that she would be in AEW very soon because of her connection with Mercedes, as Mercedes is you know, personal writer like Brian Gewertz is for Dwayne Johnson. Um, so she got a job as vice president in, in uh, creative. She's going to be part of the creative team. And we'll see. I mean, the thing is, is, is um, she vice was president of content development. Yeah. The WWE and the AEW um, system backstage machinations, they're very different. And, you know, you know, I mean, again, you just don't know, um, because a lot of what WWE does as far as presentation of the product is stuff that AEW fans don't like. That's why they're AEW fans. Um, and if you only, if this is the only system you know, perhaps you can still be helpful and perhaps, you know, you've got Tony Khan as the filter going like, okay, you know, this is fine. This isn't fine for our audience. But then, you know, will she think, hey, I was with WWE? I mean, it, 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 look, it could work. It could be a big success. It could work out. She could be a big help. But it's it's not a lock because the systems are so completely different. And, um, you know, time will tell how this is all works out. He's got a lot of new people. You know, he's got, uh, you know, new guy doing the uh, 
the live events, promotions, and things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, in months, you know, it, it's, it's going to be a new AEW, you know, with Okada, you know, Mercedes, Will Ospreay, um, you know, and, and things like that. And, um, you know, they have to, you know, they're in a hole, you know, I mean, um, they're, they're in a hole and, uh, they have to dig out of the hole, not so much a hole when it comes to TV ratings, but a hole when it comes to, um, live events, you know, I mean, there's no doubt, you know, I mean, you can sugarcoat it all you want. Um, these, you know, these attendance figures are, uh, you know, and, and some of it is, is they're running the wrong parts of the country. I mean, one thing I did, um, I actually got a listing just this week of essentially all the pay-per-view buys by state from TNA, WWE, and AEW. And it's very interesting because um, I think the one thing that's most interesting is for WWE pay-per-views, okay, the people who still buy in pay-per-view, they are most successful in states where the income, the average income, is the lowest. You would think that people who would pay $60 for a pay-per-view would probably come from more affluent states than the ones who pay whatever, you know, Peacock is nine ninety nine, I think, again. Or eight, maybe it's, maybe, I think it's eight, maybe it's eight ninety nine. I don't even know, and I, I get it, right, you know. But it's obviously nothing. But it's it's just interesting. But for AEW, it's the opposite. You know, AEW, um, you know, the more affluent um, the state is, the better they do on pay-per-view. And Oklahoma, where they were tonight, is one of the states that um, AEW does not do well on pay-per-view. But WWE does great on pay-per-view. Um, there are a lot of states... Um, and and this really does correlate, you know. I mean, I looked at the states that AEW performs the worst on pay per view, and that's the states that they've been running all these shows in. And WWE is doing great in those states on pay per view, amazingly enough. So it's um, it's you know, it's definitely very different places and different audiences that are buying the pay per views, and um, they probably you know, I mean, that's, that's it's it's an interesting thing you know like where they're more popular and where they're not um but um but i think that like they they need to be going to the states with the highest income because that's where AEW's popularity is also the highest for whatever reason you know um you know poor people don't like AEW, and i'm not saying rich people do but um people in those states seem to a lot more we had uh, injuries over the last couple of days. One of them actually took place last week with Shotzi. She's got a torn ACL, and it was one of those things in wrestling that you see all the time. They were doing some spot, and literally all she did was jump off the apron. It was and like nothing. She, she landed on two feet on the ground, and boom, there went the ACL. Yeah. And uh, we'll talk about the rest of the match on the NXT report later on. But she'll be out of action in about nine months, and obviously all the best she, to her. She, she's had a rough last couple of years which she talked about on social media her sister has cancer and had a rough time with her her, own fa her father health. died yeah her father, father died not, long, not so, too long ago yeah just a very very uh rough span of time for her and then on dynamite tonight hangman was getting lifted up for a muscle buster and he flipped out of it just landed on his feet and went down, and he immediately tagged out. He never got back into the match again. He was outside holding his ankle. When the match was over, the, like, the camera guy's like right on his face, and he's going, no, get it off, get it off. Mm -hmm. So um, he has to have it looked at, and could be a broken ankle, yeah, but it I does heard. appear to be a serious ankle injury. Yeah. And I guess we'll find out. You know, sometimes we have people getting injured, and we don't know anything about it. They don't say anything. But this guy is fighting for the world title in a little over a week. Yeah. So if he's got a broken ankle, I think we're going to hear about it real quick because they're going to have to come up with something. They'll they'll have to say something. It wouldn't be it would be on Saturday show if there's you know one way or the other. If not, if not, if they don't announce something even sooner. But on, I think that on Saturday show they're going to have to um, address it. Yeah. 
and then Jim Rollins if they had, th- if, if they if they think that he can't go and um just the nature of what happened um you know the preliminary thing i mean i heard from someone who was at ringside and said like when he was on the ground like right in front of him he was basically saying you know he thought his ankle was broken so um hopefully not and hopefully you know sometimes um sometimes a broken ankle does heal you know i don't say relatively quick but it's not like a six month thing um the nature of the break if it's a clean break it ain't a 10 day thing and it, no 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 absolutely not yeah. um guys have done shit with broken ankles i mean they, they will, I, it's not going to happen here if it's truly broken but um guys have worked on broken ankles you know believe it or not well guys have worked on got wrestlers have worked on everything I mean, they've worked on broken necks you know i mean it's just like um especially in the old days i mean when when you didn't have uh when you didn't have guaranteed money um wrestlers did stuff to because they couldn't afford not to work Jim Ross has had a lot of health issues of late, but uh, the latest is that he is recovering from a broken hip. Yeah. Yeah, his uh, hip, tailbone, he must have had a fall or something. Um, he still wants to do the uh, the Sting farewell match, you know, Sting retirement match. Um, you know, you, you know it's bad because they were in Tulsa tonight, and you know, even though he's not a dynamite announcer, the fact that they're in Tulsa, um, they would have probably brought him out just for the crowd or anything like that, but obviously he was not ready. I don't, I don't know if he's in. Um, you know, I, I've been asked. I don't know if he's in Tulsa or in Jacksonville, but it's probably not somewhere where he because he lives in Jacksonville. But he also, I mean, not Tulsa, but he, but he also has a place in Norman, which is actually a little closer to Oklahoma City than Tulsa. But you know, Tulsa's not far from there. Um, but uh, you know, he wants to be in Greensboro. He wants to call that match. You know, for historical reasons, I can see why, you know, both for him because, you know, it, it you know, the, him and Tony Schiavone were the announcers for the original Ric Flair Sting match. So after a letter writing campaign to, uh, I guess, try to get Scott Demore back by members of the TNA roster, we now have TNA wrestlers posting hourglasses on their social media, which seems like an indication that people are, Counting down track. the time. Yeah. I mean, I asked a couple of them about that, and nobody wants to say that. One of one, one person who I asked, this actually would be pretty funny, he goes, because um, I obviously not wanting to say it, just basically told me that, like, well, I only did it because I saw two other guys do it, and I thought maybe I should do it. I mean, obviously, that's what it is. Um, and as far as... um. Josh Alexander, who was one of them. Um, what happened with Josh Alexander was that um, his contract is 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 running out soon, and he basically said that um, he had hoped that he could be a free agent, and they but there's an option in his contract, and they did renew the option, which actually has come out is that they renewed his option, so he's got another year to go. And it's fine. It's not like it's anything, whatever. But, you know, I mean, if it was up to him, he probably would have gone free agent at this point. Uh, maybe not if Demore was there, but I mean, that, that's speculative or whatever. But, you know, the situation is, is that, uh, he'll be there for a year. He's going to work hard for the year. And, um, I know there's some people who want to see him in new japan and new japan does you know there's there's some openings for foreigners in new japan right now you know losing tamatonga losing will osprey um you know obviously uh, um nick nemeth and um and matt riddle um mustafa ali you know are all going to have spots there um but josh alexander you know did very well you know in uh that trios title match not all that long ago and in some of the other matches so perhaps you know perhaps he can do that along with tna Kevin Nash. So Kevin Nash asked, you know, we, we've been asked a couple times on the show about, like, do you think that WWE will allow AEW to have footage, you know, for Sting's retirement? You know, the Sting, because they own, like, most of the Sting footage. Um, TNA has a lot of Sting footage in their library. Sting was there for years and years and years. But it wasn't the famous Sting stuff. All the famous Sting stuff. 
whether it's WCW or Jim Crockett Promotions. The well, actually, it's pretty much all WCW. Um, other than the uh, the Flair Sting match, which was before the sale, because the sale was November '88, and the Flair Sting match was March 27th '88. Um, but WWE owns all the footage, and I thought like it's not going to happen. But you know, people are going like, well, you know, they when when uh, WWE asked. If Brian Danielson and Mark Henry and Paul White, you know, and Chris Jericho could do stuff for the for the um, John Cena um, special show that they did, Tony let them do it. And when you know Billy Gunn was asked if he could go to the Hall of Fame, the DX thing, Tony let him do it. So maybe they'll reciprocate. And it's like, I don't think so. But anyway, Kevin Nash, Sting asked Kevin Nash, he would like him to come wasn't necessarily even going to appear on t on television just he'd like him to be there because they're 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 friends and kevin nash you know asked wwe you know can i go there not on camera just be you know not, you know not even for necessarily a ceremony can i just go there and it was no so i think that that's probably your answer when people ask about the footage if they're not going to let kevin nash go there as a spectator they're not going to be given footage i don't think for the uh Flair Sting match from Greensboro, which, of course, would be, you know, cool footage to have on that show. All right, before we get into the shows, let's go through these ratings. Okay. Um, huge ratings for WWE. Um, Monday's Raw did um, 1,870,000 viewers with an 0 0.63, which is freaking huge in 18 to 49 and the big one was it did an 0.51 in 1834, which is like 20% above what I would call a great number. Um, they just freaking younger viewers. Uh, and it's funny because usually when it comes to these giant rating shows, you know, going in, you know, for whatever reason, it's going to be one. And this one, it's like there was nothing like that out of the ordinary i mean the big thing obviously well, was the big the, thing was that uh drew mcintyre match with cody which did a huge number did the, the well clearly that that match did um what do i uh two million uh seventy thousand viewers and an um i think it was an o point um uh, what is it i think like an o point nine or something like that or not quite that big but they did um yeah um yeah, that match that match started pretty high and ended up peaking extremely high, and that was the key to the thing. But I mean, they kept the audience um, at a pretty you know well above usual level through the whole show. You know, for the Gunther and Jey Uso did much better than most main events do. Um, so that was also a big part of it. And um, you know, again, it, it was the first Raw after Dwayne Johnson was on um, SmackDown, and I think that just the fact that Dwayne Johnson's affiliated with the show. Um, Point six nine for that uh, that match. Yeah, yeah, that's what it peaked at. Two point zero seven million viewers and a point six nine. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's big number for Raw. Huge number. Yeah, yeah, especially that. You know, yeah, just a the the eighteen forty nine number is just was just huge for that quarter. So, um, yeah, it was a big big. Um, you know, they're just they're just hot. You know, I mean, it's people are talking like i mean the one thing when when people were going like oh you know that angle you know hurt cody they hurt cody and it's like that thing helped cody so much he's much hotter and i mean this is proof this is also i'll tell you the other part of this one is, is this rating and the rating that him and seth did last week as well which was huge i mean big jump and and cody's always done well for the last two years as far as ratings on raw I mean, not always. I mean, if he's in the last segment in the main event, it goes down just like everybody else. But he does better than usual. But the last two weeks, Cody's numbers have been way up. I mean, even more than the last two weeks, the last month. His, when he's out there, the numbers have been way up. And, um, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I mean, if there's any arguments or anything like that of like, uh, maybe, you know, maybe they need to keep this title on Roman. You know what I mean? Maybe he's not going to be able to draw like Roman. And it's like, uh, I think that they should take the title, um, put it on Cody right now, and um, we'll see if they do. But you cannot point to the idea that the ratings do not, um, 
you know, indicate that Cody can carry this company, and he kind of is, really, you know, as far as full-time. Um, Rampage on Friday, of course, no collision on Saturday. UFC did a big number, by the way, for their, uh, they did a no point, uh, it was 0.46. They did a, um, they did a really big number on, um, Saturday night, even with, uh, NBA stuff, you know, so it was a great number. Friday night, um, actually I'll go SmackDown first because SmackDown did a freaking great number too, uh, 2 million. 555,000 viewers and 0.75. And some people will look at this and go like, they had The Rock and Roman, and they did essentially the same number as the week before, which is true that they did. But this week, they were going against, you know, NBA All-Star stuff. The competition was much harder. I mean, that NBA stuff on uh, Friday did very well. On Saturday and Sunday, it did great. Sunday, of course, being the All-Star game itself. Um, and so, so... You know, that was the, so it, what it looked like, especially because the show peaked really big, um, with the, um, the, uh, Rock and Roman Reigns segment, which 2,890,000 viewers. And that was the one that did, um, they did a 1.02 in 1849, which is unheard of. I don't think that there's been a segment on a WWE show that's topped to one in 1849 in God knows how long. I couldn't even, I can't, I can't even remember it's been so long. And, um, you know, so what it looked like is that the show itself, I mean, the show itself did well above usual. But, um, you know, the segments were here and there. And, it, and, and then they got that big boost in the last half hour, 20 minutes, really in the last 20 minutes of the show. And it just feels like that a lot of people were probably watching, you know, the, the NBA stuff. Um, that would have watched SmackDown, or the number would have been probably higher. But when Rock came on, you know, it was like, okay, a lot of people switched, or from wherever they were, because it was a very big gain over what they'd been doing for the final segment. So, um, you know, again, it's that's the deal there. So now for, for Rampage, they had two airings. Um, they had the uh, 7 o'clock airing, and then they had the other airing, which was 11.36 p.m. And they both did essentially the same. They both did 0.09. And, uh, you know, which, again, like, last year, they only had the 7 o'clock airing on the, the week of the All-Star game. And um, they were way up from last year, um, 39%, actually, from last year. So when you look at it and go, like, uh, that's in, in eighteen forty nine. When you look at it and you go 0.09, uh, that sucks, right? But it's like, if you compare it to what they did at 7 o'clock last year on this night with all the different things that were going on. Um, it's really not that, you know, it's better. And then the late night one doing the number, um, that came after the um, the post show, you know, show on, um, you know, on, um, on TNT. So they were actually um, in the time slot. The 7 o'clock show was actually fourth place behind the NBA All-Star event on ESPN because they were ESPN and TNT both had it. ESPN got the early stuff, TNT got the later stuff. So, so they had to go that seven o'clock show against the NBA All Star and against um, NASCAR, um, and they also got beat by Fox News. And then the second show, the eleven thirty six show, was third behind Sports Center on ESPN and Fox News, but they beat all other originals. So, while well, the number. You know, you look at 300,000 and you go like, ah, it's not a great number. When you consider the, what, what everything else was going on in the time slots, and 0.09 doesn't sound that great either. The fact is, is that it's among the highest, you know, obviously nothing close to WWE. I mean, WWE numbers are freaking through the roof. And um, it is not official official. We'll know tomorrow. But it does look like the SmackDown would be the number one show for the week on broadcast. But not on all of television because... Um, NBA All Star stuff um, did on, on the Sunday All Star game. I've seen the number, and it it did be, it did beat it. So it was not number one on TV for the week, but it the All Star game was on TNT. So um, the um, you know um, it's cable. It's different number, diff, different thing. So, but it is the first time in the history of television that a pro wrestling show was ever number one. I mean, in the, even in the fifties. I mean, they were in top 10 a lot, but they were never number one. And, you know, Hogan and Andre was number 32, number 33. 
you know, and this is number one, which is uh, something. All right, we got uh, two shows to talk about here today. The Dynamite Show, we got uh, one more Dynamite before the pay-per-view. And this show opened up with Dax and Cash versus Moxley and Claudio. And they went to a 20-minute time limit draw. And then it had a big brawl afterwards, which led to FTR challenging them to a match at the pay-per-view. So it'll be Moxley and Claudio versus FTR at Revolution. And this match was really good. I mean, you know, given they're doing a rematch in, you know, 10 days, they kind of had to save a lot. But uh, the only thing about it that was weird was at the end, like they're, they're, they do the 15-minute call. Then they do, you know, four minutes left, three minutes left, two minutes left. So there's a minute left. And FTR goes for the shatter machine on Moxley. He actually blocked it. He, well, kind of. Dax just stopped as he was lifting him. Cash just jumped and fell on his ass. And at first I thought, okay, well, Dax just stopped because he heard the bell ring. But then Dax puts him down and he starts putting him in the sharpshooter. And they have to tell him the match is over. So I don't know what happened at that finish. It was really weird. The way they called it, which which the way the announcers called it, was saying that they were saved by the bell from the shatter machine. But the shatter machine didn't even take place. No, it didn't happen. It was it was whatever it was happened, locked. happened. But he didn't so, get hit with the so, shatter machine. Yeah, so so I, what they said was probably how it was supposed to go. By the way, there's a lot of stuff on the show tonight for for various reasons. You know, Sting was supposed to be on the show, but his father died, which we'll get into in a second. Um, so that's why Ric Flair was there, was because Sting was supposed to be there. And then they did whatever they did, which whatever. We'll see what that go if that leads into anything. Um, there were a couple other people. Jeff Hardy was supposed to be on the show in a key role. Um, one of the reasons that so little was announced was because... Um, they didn't know about. They didn't know what if Sting would be able to come. Um, the Jeff Hardy and Trent Beretta was supposed to do a singles match with Orange Cassidy. I have no idea why, but it had been built up and not announced because they announced that Trent Beretta was injured and they had done an injury thing on the show, but he was actually ill and they were waiting until you know basically today, and that's when they put Mike Bennett in that spot. And um, I was told that it was very chaotic backstage because um and the reason they didn't announce anything is because so much of what they wanted to do they didn't know if they'd be able to do so they didn't want to false advertise unlike you know other things where where if you don't know you just advertise it and then well you didn't get cleared um so that's why like very you know so little was advertised compared to most and the show you know, had a disorganized feeling because it really was, you know. Um, and also I thought that the um, the crowd tonight in Tulsa, it's the first time in Tulsa, they had a little over 3,000. Um, but they were not, I mean, it's like they were hot in certain spots, but they weren't hot throughout. And it, it, they were, it was a sluggish crowd. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the show was sluggish. And I mean, there was like the Deanna Perrazzo and, um, and Mass and oh Rain match. Oh my God, that was I mean, the worst dynamite match in. I mean, that was maybe a years. Yeah, that was a genuinely bad match. Like, like, yeah, at a level that that you just don't see on on. Um, sometimes you'll see it on NXT, but but not on the other shows. And um, yeah, I just thought like overall, um, you know, I mean, I don't think it was a good night for AEW. I mean, I, the rating will be what the rating will be. I mean, the six man tag had its spots that were good but um there's a lot of stuff that that wasn't good in that match and then adam page ends up getting hurt so that's not a good thing and um yeah the 20 minute draw i mean the match was good i was actually i was real good it's a real good match um but the the singles match with moxley and, and dax last week i thought was Mild considerably match. better yeah it was considerably yeah. better but you know on pay-per-view with maybe they'll do a 30 minute time limit match or something and uh I mean, on paper, these guys should always have a great match. And it really was a, a very good match. Then we have Orange Cassidy backstage, and Renee asks him if he's cleared. And he says, well, let's ask Doc Samson. So Doc Samson says, well, Renee, unfortunately or fortunately, he needs mini minimal medical clearance. So what, what does that mean? Pauses, and Renee has to translate for him. And he goes, so it sounds like he's cleared. And Doc Sampson, who is the doctor, says, well, there's nothing I can do about it. 
I'm like, brother, you're the doctor. You want him going out there or not? Yeah. So he goes out there, George Cassidy versus I mean, Mike Bennett. You know what the worst thing about that visual was? It's like freaking Doc Samson looks like freaking Hercules Hernandez out there next to Orange Cassidy. He was uh, gigantic. That's why he's yeah. Doc Samson. Yeah. So uh, they do Orange Cassidy and Mike Bennett, and it was fine. It was kind of just there. Orange gets beaten up for a long time, and then he just countered a gotch pile driver into a beach break and pinned him. And then Strong and Taven hit the ring afterwards. They're going to go kill Orange, but Oklahoma's own Jake Hager runs down to make the save, and they announce Jake Hager versus Roddy for Rampage. Yeah. We had Renee with Cool Hand, and Ruby walks up, and so the two of them go off on their date. Mm -hmm. And That's we it. never find out anything else about their date. I don't know I, what happened. I guess it's we'll like find out. It's like Hill's we'll, date on NXT. We'll probably find out on yeah. Friday. Hopefully we'll have a follow-up on Friday. I presume. And then Ric Flair shows up. And he's talking to Renee, and Renee says, you know, what, what's going on with you and Sting in his last match? And Flair says, you know, I'm going to be honest. I'm disappointed I have not been more involved. I know there have been some personal issues on my part, but I feel like I should have been right in the middle of this, and I haven't been here for a month. So I'm going to go explore some other options. And he walks off. He knocks on the door. It's the Young Bucks locker room. He says, I'd like to talk. And they say, okay, come on in. So they're teasing that Flair is going to be in cahoots with the Young Bucks for Sting's last match. So we're going to get we're going to get the spot in the match where we don't know which side Rick's going to hit, who's Rick's going to hit with a chair or something? That sure sounds like what they're going to do to me. Okay, well, it's fine. And you know, if it's Ric Flair and Sting, I actually don't know because, you know, they've feuded for a hundred years now. Yeah, and you never know if Flair wants to put one over on him at the end. Yeah, the only the only negative of this is is that nobody wants to boo Ric Flair. I mean, actually, a lot of people want to boo Ric Flair for other reasons, but the seventy four year old guy, seventy five actually, will be seventy five this week, right? Seventy five this week, yes, seventy five on uh, what day? What day? Will, what day is the twenty fifth? Thursday, the twenty fifth. Twenty fifth is his birthday. All right. So anyway, it's like it's like. It never works when he goes heel. He he, especially now. You know what I mean? It's just like it just doesn't fit. I know I said nobody wants to boom. There there are people who probably do want to boom, but not in the arenas. They don't. I mean, he hasn't been booed at arenas or anything like that. Um, but by the way, we didn't talk about this, but uh, Dwayne Johnson and his Seven Bucks Entertainment are behind the Flair movie, which has been talked about for years, and they actually made the official announcement today that they are doing this movie. And when I heard, um, I I don't know, I think that you could actually do, um, I think you could do a fascinating Ric Flair movie if you told the truth. Wouldn't necessarily be good. I mean, better than the docs because there's so many different things that you could do and talk about. I mean, all of it. And, you know, not necessarily flattering necessarily to Flair, but... Um, th there's really a lot, and I don't know. You know, when I think of like Dwayne Johnson movies, when it comes to wrestling, it's there's all there's the one, uh, the obvious one, right? Fighting with my family, and that was like a bubblegum movie. You know what I mean? It's like, and I don't know how you do. Like you could do that with Ric Flair, but it's like, God, would that be missing the the boat? You know what I mean? Like the, you know, like the young rock version of Ric Flair. So um, maybe they'll surprise me. But I actually think that, um, man, I mean, I, I just, I'd love to sink my teeth into a movie like that, you know, like uh, just all the different aspects of flair. And I mean, there's, you know, especially now when you talk about some of the stuff from that, from the past and even the present, you know, um, maybe not the present present, but certainly in the last 10 years. And, you know, there, there's, there's, a, it's, there's a real fascinating story to Ric Flair. Um, I really don't want to get into it now, but um, it's it's um, just about changes in eras and the, you know, when stars are mollycoddled and the changes in the world and someone who, you know, grew up in a different world, essentially, than this world and, 
you know, things changed in so many ways. And, um, and I'm not trying to be sympathetic to him at all. Everyone will say that that's what I'm trying to do. It's just, it is actually a really fascinating thing. And it's, again, it's almost like a Vince thing, you know, and I'm not trying to compare Rick to Vince, but, you know, the idea that, you know, Vince was, in, in, you know, a movie on Vince would actually be interesting, even more interesting now, too, because of the whole th- situation of, you know, all those things he did in an era where it was all going to be covered up because he's a rich guy. And with Rick, it's not so much covered up. It was just viewed in a different way because he's a superstar athlete who the promoters are going, you know, whether it's tax issues, whether it's whatever issues, right? The promoter, you know, when Ric Flair's there in the 70s and the 80s, the promoter's just going to bail him out because he's Ric Flair, you know, and if he's broke and he needs money, someone's going to, so, so you don't learn fiscal responsibility. And, um, but that's like part of the story. And with, um, with Vince, you don't learn to live like a human being because everyone's just fawns on you all the time and you can do no wrong. And then things change and all of a sudden, all of those things catch up to you. And, um, they're, they're both, I hope Dwayne doesn't do a movie on Vince. That might actually be, you know, whatever. But, but they, they have a, they have a subject, um, that I think could be really fascinating, but I don't know. I don't know what they will do with it. Um, because again, like, um, certainly the page movie certainly did not go into the dark side of, of her or, or go into any depth. And it was just kind of this fantasy movie where they try to pretend that, um, the very thing that got her over, which was the fact that she performed at, um, Full Sail University, the, the originally in NXT, she performed at Full Sail University as, and she was the same age as the, the, as the college students and really good looking. And the college students just loved her. Remember, she got over really, really big. And in the movie, it was like, oh, she wasn't good looking enough. And that's why she didn't make it in NXT. And it's like, what? You know, it was like the exact opposite of reality. And I, I don't know with Rick, you know, I don't know. The opposite of Rick Flair's reality probably won't, would not be that great of a movie. We had Tony Daniel Garcia, and he cut a promo about how he had the lowest point of his career in his life as he was losing all those Continental Classic matches. But he got one win at the end, and it turned his entire life around. And they told him that, Christian, you and uh, or you and Adam Copeland are the top two contenders, but Copeland is injured, and so therefore it is you and Christian coming up at a revolution. So that means and, we're going to get three more months of, of Christian and Adam Copeland before the next pay-per-view? Yes, we are. It's been it's it's just it's just been too long. I mean, we had from December till March, and then um, now they're not. You know, and all they've done is build this match up, and then they, you know, for two straight months they build a match up, and then they go with Christian and Daniel Garcia. But I mean, it you know the re- the reality is is that I, I can kind of get it because those guys probably want it to drag out longer. And the other thing is is that. From a marketable marketability standpoint, of course, Adam Copeland is it's a bigger match, and they may you know he may do a run in at the end or something. Um, you know they may have a storyline there, but the the you know as much as I say like ah but I've been built up for the Adam Copeland match, I'm disappointed. The reality is like on this show, whether it succeeds or fails, and it's probably going to succeed. It's all about Sting. This show's all about Sting. So whatever you do on the undercard, you know you don't you can save things because. You know, Adam Copeland and Christian's not going to make any difference in how many people buy this show. They're buying it for Sting. Or they're not buying it. Well, Christian came out and he said, you know, I don't think you deserve this match at the pay-per-view. He said he would never defend the title against Adam Copeland ever. And he says, I know something about you that people don't know. He said, do you know uh, Jackie Garcia in Buffalo, New York, married to Daniel Garcia? David Garcia. David Garcia, yes. David was your father, Daniel, and your father is dead. And he says, we all know your father wasn't so great. He was a dirty alcoholic, lost his life to the bottle. Unlike him, I don't want to hurt you. I want to help you. I don't want to be your opponent. I want to be your father. And so Garcia flips out and he says, don't ever talk about my beautiful mother again. And if you want to talk about my father, how about you head to the ring and I'll put you in the ground next to him. So Christian sends out Nick. Nick gets his ass kicked. He starts sending down Kill Switch, but then Daddy Magic makes a save with a chair, and they send the heels packing, and I don't know, man. 
Daddy Magic's turning on Daniel Garcia sooner rather than later, I think. Yeah. I I Is will say, I will say that I thought that um because of Sting's father dying, that if this was the direction they probably at least should have saved, you know, waited a week for it. Because I don't know about two fathers dying being angles on the same wrestling show. I mean, one, you know, it's you know, I mean I know I know that the I know it was planned. I know it was planned, but because of the thing that happened to Sting and the fact that they brought up what happened to Sting I just didn't think that this was, it just felt like, you know, I, it, it didn't sit well with me that they did two of them on the same show. It just, um, I don't know, you know, it, I mean, I'm not good with using deaths in, in angles in, in a lot of ways. And Stings wasn't in an angle. Um, Christian was great in his delivery. He's fantastic. But, um, yeah, I wish that they would have waited a week for this one. We had Tony Storm beating Sydney Winnell quickly with the Venus de Milo. And then Deanna came out for a match with Madison Rain, and my God, this match was terrible. The Tony Storm oh, match was the Tony Storm match was it was short, but um, you know the um, her opponent didn't seem like she was you know ready for this level of television. But no, I mean, freaking Madison Storm's opponent was way more ready for this than Madison Rain was. Man. Because Madison Rain, I don't know what happened during the commercial break, but they came back from the commercial and she was exhausted. And she's she wrestled in months. Anything. And just... Deanna tried to flatline her, and Madison, for reasons I cannot explain, tried to take a flip bump and she got planted right on her head. Like the referee's immediately down there to make sure she didn't break her neck. And it's just brutal. And then Deanna submitted her with the ankle lock. I mean, this match was terrible. This was it the was, worst it was, dynamite it was a, match in years. Yeah, it was just a bad match. Yeah, yeah. So then Tony Storm hits the ring afterwards. Deanna lays her out. Mariah distracts her, allowing Tony to put her in an ankle lock with a leg scissors. And the referee doesn't even call for security. The referee's trying to get Luther to break it up. And, of course, Luther doesn't break it up. And so uh, she ends up getting put in the hold forever before uh, Tony finally releases it. So... I mean, it was an angle and everything, but my God, that uh, Madison Raid match, that was brutal. Yeah. It didn't, it didn't, um, you know, I mean, Deanna didn't look that great either. It was, it was, I mean, I mean. No, and the fans are never into Deanna's matches. They are dead for every single one of her matches. They were they very were dead. So they were very, they were dead. They were dead. I know when this thing was over, even though they shot the angle and everything, it felt. It just, man, it, it felt like that match was struck, you know, like the, the interest wasn't Cold there. Cold match. Well, this, this took it down. You know, you get, you get a bad match with Tony Storm, um, because of the nature of the opponent being so green. And then you get followed with another bad match. It's like, that doesn't, you know, I mean, do all the angles you want. It's like, and Tony Storm, you know, I mean, her character can, can be very, very over, but you know, again, in, in this was one of those cities where, it didn't feel like the Tony Storm character was that over, and um, that hurt too. And yeah, the Deanna match, aside from being a bad match, it was also a dead crowd for the match, yeah. We had a Darby and Sting promo, which was everything that they should have done a week ago. Yeah. So Sting, or Darby. It was actually great. Has, it was freaking great. Darby has photos of Sting and his sons in the 90s, and he says, you know, Bucks, Sting's kids in this picture the same age as your kids are now. And this is the only thing that matters in the end, family. And so then Sting shows up, and he says, you know, this strikes nerve with me right now. Nobody's ever messed with my flesh and blood until you guys. Got a lot going on in my personal life over the past couple of weeks. My father passed away a week ago. He was a hero to me. He taught me right. Makes me think a lot about my own mortality. I used to think I was invincible. Sometimes I kind of still feel that way. But time catches up with everybody. It caught up with me for sure. I know I'm not invincible, but one thing I do know is everything I have left in me, I'm bringing a revolution. And Bucks, you've got a fight on your hands, the fight of your life. He was great in this yeah. segment. Yeah. And obviously, you know, when you're talking about something that really happened to you, a real tragedy, I mean, you're going to get real life. And that's what we got in this promo. I mean, Sting was fantastic and... You know, this was this best was wishes what they to, needed to follow best, up on that beating. Best wishes to him. He's been dealing with this for for a while, and um, you know, it's it's that's just 
you know, I mean, you know, he, you know, again, right at the time he was going to retire, you know, all, this happened. So, um, you know, um, but that it's part of life, you know. I mean, what can you say? But uh, you know, yeah. I mean, from as a you know, but originally, like you know, Sting, Sting, and Darby were supposed to be on the show, doing something, you know, whatever they were going to do. That that had to be taken off because uh, they shot the photo. That was a, they they shot all that at Sting's house in you know so in uh, Dallas area, I think. And we had Wardlow coming out for a promo, which probably was the best Wardlow promo I think I've ever heard. Easily, he essentially is pissed off that he has never fought for a world title before. And he brings up all the guys he beat. He beat Punk's ass worse than anybody ever, to the point his body is still falling apart because of him. He talked about squashing MJF like nobody had ever squashed him in his career. Talked about choking out Joe the last time they wrestled. And he says, I'm better than you, and you know it. I'm starving. I'm everything a world champion is supposed to be. There is nobody back there bigger, stronger, or faster than me, and there's nobody that can stop me. And he says, if anybody wants to get in my way, this is no longer wrestling. This is a war. Yeah, they're doing uh, what, what I think what they call it is like a meat match. Yes, they're, called, they're having a meat. What the hell do they call it? A meat match. It sounded like a battle royal with big dudes. Well, I but think ha- he's just going to go through a bunch of big dudes. I don't know if it's a battle royal, okay. but it could be. But what the hell do they call it? Meat Madness. Meat Madness, yeah. They're having Meat Madness with Wardlow. Wardlow and Hobbs, and Hobbs is in it too, and I don't know who else. Yeah. So Callis said, win or lose, Takesh and Osprey would still be members of the family. He said everybody thought Will was going to fly home from the U.K. with Tony after the Rev Pro show, but I am going to go pick him up in the Don Callis family chat. And he said Hobbs was the biggest, strongest, would hurt a lot of people, so I guess it is probably a battle royal. Yeah, and Sammy, you'll be in Tulsa at Rampage. We have a score to settle with you. So then the main event was RBD Hook and Hangman versus Swerve, Brian Cage, and Samoa Joe. And of course, this was a match where Hangman got hurt, flipped over on the Muscle Buster, injured his ankle, tagged in RVD, never saw the guy again, and RVD ended up getting choked out by Samoa Joe for the finish, and kind of a real abrupt ending to the show, probably because they may have. You know, been planning to do something with Hangman, and then they couldn't because he was he was injured. Maybe, but um, you know, they had a lot of spots with Joe and Swerve and Hangman together. And what's interesting about the match is, you know, they put it together, and Hangman was on the babyface team, and Swerve was on the heel team, and Hangman and worked was as a babyface. Show where the Hangman was booed and Swerve was cheered. Hangman was totally over as a babyface. Yeah, he got a babyface hot tag. He made a babyface comeback. Like, okay. he was a baby face from start to finish in this match. Okay, but here's the thing. They were in Tulsa. A cowboy is going to be a baby face in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Well, he was definitely a baby face here. So so may, that may be, like, them out thinking, you know, like, because, you know, the idea of, you know, like, he's probably not going to get booed in Tulsa, so let's make him a baby face in Tulsa. So, um but it, it it is weird though because you're on national television you're not playing local markets and they legit like Adam Page turned I mean he absolutely turned heel Swerve turned babyface and then here Swerve's on the heel side and Page is on the babyface side Swerve had but, less of a turn he's still with the Mogul Embassy who are all heels but Hangman for sure did a full fledged heel turn yeah well there we are. And then Joe was a heel, even though everyone cheers him. Yeah. And they did a lot with Joe and Hook, you know, playing off of the match that they had. So um, they were in a lot, you know, built you know, Joe beating him up a lot. And then uh, Hook making some comebacks, building up to the big suplex spot late in the match. Yep. Um, you know, the match was here hit and miss. Like, there was some really good stuff in the match. And there was some really so-so stuff in the match. I was not... I wouldn't call it a great match, but there were there were some really cool spots in the match. You know, a lot with Paige, really. Paige had a had a hell of a match till he got hurt. And and Joe and Hook were good. Um other points, you know, not quite as good. NXT show was taped. We went over the spoilers last week, but a couple of notes. Oba Femi beat Le- Lexus King, North American title match, and just like a quick match. I mean, it wasn't a squash, but they certainly did not look 
uh, book Lexus like anything resembling a star. He no. just got beat clean in the middle, power bombed, and that was that. Pretty uh, kind of a one sided match, really. But yeah, uh, no, it was like an, it was a, it was a total enhancement match. Yeah, Mr. Stone. I mean, they, they, did, they, did, they, they did they did they they did they did a thing where um um he went after he shoved down Robert Stone and then got in the ring and got beat. I mean, but really, he didn't play a part in the finish, though. No. No, he he uh, he shoved him on his ass, got in the ring, and Oba made a full comeback, yeah. and then hit his move and won. So it didn't even directly lead to the finish. So yeah, it was weird. Then Thea's backstage, and she's all sad about the date with Riley, and JC wants to know what happened, and she basically says, "Well, I tried to do everything myself. I texted the entire time. I didn't want to make it look like it was too available." So JC's aghast, and then Ariana shows up, and that sets up a match for later on. Then we had a Lyra Tatum segment. These are all good. terrible. Just not good. God. Yeah, basically, Lyra said, "Stay in the back for my main event tonight, and if you do, I will give you a big surprise." And Lyra said that staying in the back for the main event would be the hardest thing she has ever done. And by the way, I don't know what was supposed to happen because the main event got all screwed up. So I yeah. guess we'll see what happens next week. Braun and Corbin are in the ring. And Chase U, Frazier, and Axiom all come out. And, of course, they all want a championship match. So then Ava has to come out and sign a number one contenders match for later. Nathan and Axiom versus Chase U. Winners get Baron Corbin and Braun Breaker. We had Roxanne beating Ren Sinclair with a crossface. We had the No Quarter Catch crew challenging Noam Dar. He will be facing one of them next week, but apparently they have special rules where you don't know who it's going to be until they get into the ring. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, Noam says it doesn't seem fair. And I was like, it's not fair. It doesn't I don't know how they got away with that. But it makes no sense at all. No. For a championship it, match. It can be any one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Josh Briggs and Brooks Jensen... And actually, for given given how long these guys have been together, you know, this was like not even the top of the second hour. This was like forty minutes into the show, and they beat the hell out of each other. Uh, Briggs ended up bleeding from the lip, and he hit a series of lariats, including a rabbit lariat, got the pin, and then he gave Brooks a big hug and told him, "I did this for you. I love you." So, I don't know where they're going. I don't think they should be teaming back up, but I don't know. We'll see. Joe Gacy video with Die Jack. Probably this stuck too. Oh, this was horrible. Yeah. So uh, Joe Gacy uh, apparently has his own padded room somewhere. And no, no, it was it was, it was Die, Die Jack had kidnapped him. He, yeah, he's got a he owns a padded room. He's kidnapped. Die Jack does. Yeah, I figured Die, he, it was Die, 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 I was, it seemed to be in Die Jack's place, and then. So they do this thing where he's kidnapped the guy, and the lawyer, Luca Crucifino, explains to Dijak that, in fact, you could get into trouble for kidnapping. Yeah, you cannot you cannot kidnap a guy. You cannot put him in a padded room in a straitjacket and hold him against his will. And yeah. Dijak's answer is, well, he violated my law. And Crucifino's like, the real world doesn't work that way, brother. But he left. And then Gacy told Dijak that this was not over. This was quite bad. Then we had Mello at the barber shop. This was great. He just essentially did a promo explaining. He, I mean, he came off as a total main eventer here, much better than last week's show. And he said, "You know, I, uh, I you and I were together forever. You and me, Trick. I even let you be first in Trick Mello, but uh, you weren't happy being number four, number three. I would have even let you be number two, but you had to be number one." And when you try to take something away from me, well, uh, I have ruthless ambition. So anyway, he says, uh, challenges Ilya Dragunov for a championship match. It looks like that's taking place at Roadblock, which is pretty much what we expected. And I presume he wins that match and then faces Truth over Trick. WrestleMania weekend. Trick. Yeah. Trick. Yeah, I'm sorry, Trick. Yeah. We had Ariana Grace and JC Jane. Not, Which, not good. No. They got a new girl, Jasmine Nix. Yes. She's the new heel. Who apparently is out there the, with J.C. Jane. The new heel and, The new heel from Chase U, who's 
going to be like her and JC are best friends and Thea is kind of like the third wheel now. Yep. So they, uh, so JC wanted Thea to interfere and Thea refused. But then at the end, Jasmine Nix, she agreed to interfere. And so she clobbered Ariane leading to the finish. And then Jasmine and JC celebrate together and Thea, she wants nothing to do with this. We had a Tony D stacks promo where basically he said he needs to show the world that he's the Don of NXT. So I guess they're going to uh, not be going after the tag team titles. He's got some other plan. It sound, I thought at first that he was going to go after the singles title. So it sounded th- like to me. Yeah, but um, he just seemed, I don't know. Well, I guess they'll, he's gonna, I'm sure they'll explain it like next week. So, yeah. Ridge Holland said next week he's going to address the fans, apologize for his actions, and he's going to see if anybody cares. We had Axiom and Nathan Frazier versus Chase U, which was a pretty damn great tag match because yeah. Axiom and Nathan Frazier are great. And, they're, they're great, you know, Andre yeah. and Duke Hudson, they're a good team. And Frazier ended up rolling through a series of cradles with Chase, and then Andre hooked the legs and pinned him. So it is Chase U getting the tag team title shot. But then after the match, Gallows and Anderson attacked, and they laid everybody out, and apparently they want the NXT tag team titles. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is is that I, I'm i guessing that um, they don't want one of those two teams to beat Braun Breaker and Corbin, and maybe they'll put Gallows and Anderson over. Could do that, yeah. Or or maybe Gallows and Anderson. And it gives them something to do because they ain't doing nothing on the main roster right now. No. Well, they're just like sidekicks for AJ Styles. We had Kalani Jordan and Lash Legend, and uh, Lash won with a slam off the top, and it was fine for what it was. It was very basic. Lash has improved a lot, but uh, just kind of a match. Then we had Lyra and Shotzi for the women's title. Talked about this earlier. They're doing a match. Shotzi just jumps off the apron, blows out her knee. They go to commercial. They come back. Ava has to make the surprise announcement that whoever is the next person to walk through the curtain gets a championship match. So it ends up being Lash, Lash legend. She just had a match. They call her out for an impromptu, call it in the ring, live television main event, and it looked like the referee was in there calling the entire match for him. Like they had somebody in the back calling spots to the referee who was then telling them what to do. And, you know, for what it was for six minutes, impromptu, Injury just happened. I mean, they made it work. It was okay. Uh, lashing up going it, was, to the top. it was. It was okay. It was nothing special at all, but it was okay. No. But Lyra shoved her off the top, hit a big splash, and pinned her. And it certainly was not great, anything like that. But you know, for for having to come up with something on the fly on a live, it wasn't even live. It was taped. But like they were going live to tape. They were like rushing to get it in the ring. Yeah. I mean, I thought that. Uh, well, there was actually a long time between all that. You know what I mean? Yeah, because in actuality, like when when Shotzi got hurt, they didn't know what to do for a long for a while, which did not all air on television. No, but I mean they uh, they made it work at the end. So I mean that was uh, given Lash's experience level. I mean I thought she did a pretty good job. All right, let's go through the uh, rampage spoilers. Okay, there's very little that I have here at this point, but it's um, Young Bucks want to squash. Uh, Mariah May beat Anna J. Anna J's fortune's not doing so well. Roderick Strong beat Jake Hager, of course. And then the three-way, uh, top flight won, uh, um, it was just three-way, it was a three-way trios match. So it was top flight and Action Andretti winning over Matt Seidel and Private Party. And the third team was, um, Penta and, uh, Commander and Brian Keith, which is a weird team. Um, and so anyway, Top Flight and Andretti won. So in theory, they should be in line for one of those trios titles. We've got two trios champions that never defend. So, you know, the Bang Bang Scissors gang. So probably one of those. And, you know, it's fine. It's as good a team as any. All right, before we go, this weekend we've got uh, the Elimination uh-huh. Chamber. Saturday is ridiculous. Yeah, we talked about this on on Monday. Yeah. But uh, Elimination Chamber has Seth Rollins' opponent being named in a chamber match with Drew McIntyre, Randy Orton, L.A. Knight, Bobby Lashley, and uh, I guess, who are the other two? 
Do we have them yet? We have them. Every, everyone's there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I got an old lineup. Hold on a second. I'll find this. That's what happens when you don't replace the lineup after Raw Monday. All right. Elimination Chamber 2024. This is the show in Perth. It airs at 5 a.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. Drew McIntyre, 2, a, 2 a.m. Pacific. LA Knight, 2, Kevin Owens, 2, and Logan Paul. 2 a.m. Pacific, not 2, 2 p.m. 2 a.m. Pacific. So that's the Elimination Chamber so match. Two, for so it's, it's, it's 2 a.m. late Friday night, not not yeah. Saturday night. Rhea Ripley, Nia Jax for the women's title. The women's Elimination Chamber match with Becky, Bianca, Liv, Tiffany, Naomi, and Raquel. And we've got Judgment Day versus Pete Dunn and Tyler Bate for the tag team titles. So that is the lineup for that show. And uh, Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins in the uh, Grayson Waller effect. That's right, the Grayson Waller effect. And some surprises. Oh, yeah? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know what they are. (laughs) You don't know what they are? Okay. I thought maybe you were not telling us something. No, no. Rumors. There's rumors, but uh, mm. it's not It's not The Rock. Don't worry. All right. And then Saturday, we also have Collision. Brian Danielson versus June Akiyama on Brian's uh, farewell tour of all of his favorite wrestlers. FTR versus Shane Taylor and Lee Moriarty. And Jay White, Billy, and Austin Gunn in it's Colton, trio Colton, It's Colton Gunn. Colton Gunn. Colton Gunn. Not Colton Austin. Gunn. So yeah. that's, the, uh, that's the lineup for Collision. What else do we have Saturday. Ah, uh, two new Japan shows because there's got the um the uh I mean the Friday show, um and then the Saturday show. And I didn't bring the lineups with me, but um it includes um uh the first night I think has uh, Nick Nemeth and David Finley going for the global title and Matt Riddle and Tanahashi for the T V title. And the second night's got uh um uh Tetsuya Naito and Sonata and um you know, a bunch of other stuff, but uh, two major shows. And uh, UFC's got a show from Mexico City with Brandon Marino and um, Brandon Royval, and, uh, which is a big fight. Winner uh, probably going to get a shot at uh, Alexander Pantoja for the flyweight title. And um, the uh, PFL and Bellator have their big showdown. It's supposed to be six champion versus champion matches ends up being two because uh, ideas for matches all fell through but it's still the by far by far the most loaded and biggest pfl show in history from saudi arabia so it's an afternoon show and um, good undercard um good you know it's a pretty loaded up show so um i don't know there's uh in this calendar day, when I looked at it, it was uh, five shows, six shows, because Collision, six shows to watch. So I don't know which ones I'm going to watch, but uh, I'm just going to sit and watch wrestling all day, basically, till we, till we do our show. Well, we will be doing a show on Saturday night covering Elimination Chamber and whatever we end up watching from that day. So that'll be the next show. The new Observer is going to be up on the front page. Back issue is up as well, yes. and we awards had- awards awards issue. So Friday is going to be um, a quite the comedic day. We are going to see some really sad people come to the foreground. Oh, insanity with with tremendous levels of insanity, and uh, there you go. All blaming you, even though these are uh, voted upon by the readership. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 But I mean, it's good because. Um, you know, at the end of the day, most people who should win won. So there you go. I mean, there's, um, there were two close races, I think. Um, as I recall, there were, you know, one very close, one sort of close, and all the other ones were pretty solid. You know, I mean, it was like pretty, pretty solid as far as like, uh, who won almost everywhere. So it was, uh, not, you know, it was the right people. Probably one in most cases. All right, everybody. Then I know we're going to wrap it up for today. As noted, new Observer and Back Issue are up. Lots of shows up on the front page. I'll be back tomorrow for Observer Live. And that is it, everybody. We'll talk.